this is great content and want to be able to access it later. Why are we doing office hours? We know this is an important part of adult learning is talking about why we're doing things. And we know that assistive and instructional technologies using those is one of the Council for Exceptional Children's high leverage practices. And those are those practices that when we implement them in learning practices for students with disabilities, they have the greatest um, impact on, on student achievement. When we are considering assistive technology, we often use the SET framework, and that's looking at the student, the environments, the tasks, and the tools. So make sure that you're thinking through that lens too as we go through information today, and know that that's a good tool for equity, making sure that every student gets exactly what it is that they need. All right, so without further ado, I will hand it over to today's guests. We have Jessica Knutson, Cindy Matheson, and Handy Bober here with us today to talk about transition and AT. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and hand it over to you. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Jessica Knutson. I'm the Secondary Transition Coordinator and Workplace Learning Coordinator for Northern Light Special Education Cooperative. And Julie was gracious enough to ask me to come attend this and speak to um secondary transition and assistive technology and um i immediately thought i need to bring in some other folks outside of the school um districts and two people that we closely work with at northern lights but also just in general that post-secondary lens employment lens is hannah and cindy so hannah why don't you just introduce yourself and then Cindy you can go after that yeah, my name is Hannah Bober. I am the assistant director with the Center for Equal Access at the College of St. Scholastica. Hi, I'm Cindy Matheson. I am a transition counselor with Minnesota Vocational Rehab Services, and I serve five schools up the North Shore, Proctor, McGregor, and Cromwell Wright. And I also roped in <laughs> um, a couple other workplace learning coordinators at Northern Lights. Dee LeBlanc, I don't know, Dee, if um, Laura's there as well, but um, he um, helps me out with even secondary transition in a lot of our buildings. So she has a lot of information um, regarding assistive technology. She's amazing working with students, like um, with severe multiple impaired students. So. Share some good insight to share as well. All right, next slide, Julie. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was super excited to, to be able to present today because I really feel well, first of all, my passion is um secondary transition. Um, this is my ninth year within this role. Um, and every year I feel gets more exciting um because of just the legislative pushes with um supporting individuals with disabilities and especially in the in the world of employment and then post-secondary education and so i think assistive technology is something that you know from my viewpoint at times kind of just gets looked over quickly with the lens of secondary transition um and so i really want to provide more emphasis and support teachers with having a deeper conversation with families, with students, and at IEP meetings about how can we incorporate more assistive technology in a student's high school, middle school experience um, to increase their independence and prepare them for that next phase moving into adulthood. Um, I think a lot of times often kids are leaving high school maybe still a little too reliant on the adults in their life. Um, and there's there's tools that we can be incorporating and having them utilize in school that will um, provide them with more success um, in multiple settings moving into adulthood. And so um, I look at assistive technology can really help break down a lot of barriers that students might be facing, whether it's academically, functionally, emotionally, behaviorally, um, even mental health wise, and really looking at that independence piece for work. Um, and then um, I look at just the independent living skills as well. Like what are some things that we could be focusing on in the home, in the community, rec and leisure, all, all sorts of those things. Um, you know, in talking about assistive technology, I think it's really important, you know, 
supporting teachers with how can we trial some of this assistive technology while they're in high school and identify some options for them to, to um, trial out and become comfortable. And I know Hannah and, and Cindy can probably attest to sometimes it, it is probably more cumbersome and challenging if they're entering into, you know, say Scholastica, for example, and haven't even tried voice to speech or text to voice or any type of tool that can support them. Like there's a bigger learning curve on top of just following kind of the rigor of, of those courses. So I think it's really our due diligence, at, at, especially in the high school, to really get kids comfortable with that. And kids right now, they're, they're born with devices in their hands. So um, I think that's, you know, we need to use that to our benefit. So um, working on building that confidence prior to them leaving. Okay, next one. So I wanted to briefly talk about just what is transition or secondary transition. These are always the three things I talk with people about in terms of preparing students and families. And that's the other big part. Like I feel our job, you know, as high school special education teachers, as those that support families is educating families. Families only know what they know. And a lot of times they don't have the knowledge and experience um, and know kind of the ins and outs on how to help their child transition from school into the adult world. So I think it's really important that we are coaching every student and every family to think about life after high school. The four plus years that students are with us go by extremely fast. Um, and so having these conversations early and start talking about what they want to do after high school and, and identifying those different pathways and exploring like the branches that can veer off from that um, I think are really important to start using that language early enough so parents are feeling comfortable and students are leaving high school with a plan or supports or services in place. Um, the other thing is just designing that high school experience to ensure that they are attaining the skills and competencies um, that meet their post-secondary visions. Granted, those post-secondary visions sometimes can be maybe unrealistic or they might not come to fruition, but it is our job to really like find the courses, the special education services, pulling in folks like Cindy, for example, with VRS to help support these students gaining those skills and experiences prior to leaving. And then lastly is identifying and linking. That's really important. And I tell so many of our teachers, we don't have to do it alone in the classroom. Um, and there's so many resources and agencies out there right now that can support high school age students and families. Um, we need to start pulling them in. So those folks at those agencies get to know those students and those families prior to them leaving. You know, that's especially important with like county services. Um, and so right now, you know, when we look at bulk rehab with the three X that we have, like, which is amazing. Um, and I feel like a lot of districts are taking advantage of that, but to have folks come in and working on top of what special education teachers are doing, working on these skills for workplace readiness and self-advocacy and post-secondary counseling and work experiences uh, is amazing. And they can help with the assistive technology piece. That's what's you know really cool about that. There's tools that they can be doing outside of the school district um, that could really kind of supplement already what we're instructing in school. Next slide, Julie. So regarding transition planning, um, you know, identifying those needed services and what are some activities. I always think like, you know, the student has their measurable goals where they see themselves going after high school. Then we have our annual goals, working on those skills, those lagging skills that they need. Um, and then we have those transition services. And I always think those are these, like the sprinkles on the cupcake. These are the kind of side things we get to do with kids, the activities, the experiences, the fun things that we can do um, to really help them meet their post-secondary goals. Um, and AT should be a big consideration with each of those areas. And, you know, I'm talking about the instructional side, the related services, the community participation, the employment side of things, and then the independent living. Um, I think it's really important that you know, we, when we look at each of those areas, we're thinking about assistive technology in each of those. If a student is identifying a post-secondary pathway, 
<laughs> thinking about their disability and how that might impact um, them at that setting and what assistive technology tools could we use that could support them with that. Um, you know, MBE talks a lot about, we should be talking about transition in elementary school. Uh, and start having kids being able to identify their strengths, interests, and preferences. And so as students are progressing through middle and high school, um, they're going to be ready for the adult world. And also looking at assistive technology, it's just going to be um, very natural for them to utilize those things. So I think when we look at just naturally students transition from elementary to middle school to high school, and each time uh, there's more complexities with each of those transitions, it's the same with moving into the adult world. There's more challenges and things that we have to work out, but um, they become more comfortable, I guess, once we are utilizing some of these tools. The other important thing to consider from my lens is just uh, who's going to help them once they transition into the adult world. So, you know, when I think about vocational rehab, a lot of times, and Cindy will probably elaborate on this more, just doing an assessment um, in the home and, and with the student and in the community to look at, like, what are some tools that could support them um, and what is that transition going to look like? A lot of times we rely on our speech language pathologists and schools to help with, like, you know, augment, sorry, um, tools. But uh, what is that going to look like when we're all gone and they're into that next phase of adult services and who's going to support them um, utilizing and carrying on these tools? Um, and like I said, involve the outside agencies. That's really important to do that. <clears throat> okay, Julie. Thinking across all the settings, like I've, I've said before, really thinking about that employment, post-secondary, and independent living, which I learned left yesterday, you guys. MBE is changing independent living to interdependent. Uh, so start using that vocabulary. But in breaking that down, like how will that disability impact them and attaining their measurable post-secondary goals. Like D, I'm gonna brag about you, but um she's so good with working with kids on a job site and pulling in whatever assistive technology the student needs, if it's just basic sweeping or wiping a table, like the littlest of things, the low-tech things that make it work. Um, and that's so important because when those students transition from D being in a school work experience to transitioning with Cindy and her services, um, either utilizing the same things or increasing whatever those those um, assistive technology tools might be. <clears throat> Next slide. So one thing that I think is really important for high school students and families to understand is that when they are transitioning from school, they're transitioning from idea to Americans with Disabilities Act, and that's really important for them to understand um, because there is substantially some big differences, as you can see from the comparison of these two. A lot of times idea, like when you look at that top-down responsibility to moving to ADA where it's the student up responsibility, that's where I see so much um, struggling with kids is you know, and I was a case manager as well. Like sometimes I'd find myself and have to slap my hand of like, I need to pull back and not help so much and let students try things on their own. Kind of that dignity of risk while there's that safety network prior to them, you know, moving into adulthood and teaching self-determination skills. Um, understanding that they are going to have to advocate for themselves and no one's going to come to them. <clears throat> and Hannah can, you know, speak to that of just kind of what that process looks like. Um, you know, and with IDEA, the accommodations are designed to ensure success versus ADA is that ensure opportunity for success. So again, big differences. And again, it's really important for students and families to, to understand, understand those differences. Next slide, Julie. So I put together just some tidbits and maybe I can kick this over to you, Hannah, um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of talking about your perspective of assistive technology. Yeah. <clears throat> so in college, I guess in the last few years, um, 
assistive technology is becoming more popular. Um, you know, previously it was used for students that were low vision and or um, deaf, hard of hearing, where, you know, those students have a lot of assistive technology available to them. Um, but other programs are becoming more common um, across campuses. Um, so some of those are around like note taking and like um, text to speech options um, that help a lot of students. So we at the College of Science Glasgow, we use a program called Gleam, which is an online audio note-taking software that allows students to record their lectures um, and then actually have that lecture transcribed. So it eliminates the need um, for majority of our students to have a peer note-taker or getting those notes from faculty. So it puts that independence on the student, puts some of that um, back on the student of you need to be in class, you need to be doing this, you know, versus just relying on another student's notes. Um, it's also helped a lot with just that accommodation in general was becoming increasingly hard to find peers that were willing to take notes and provide their notes and doing it in a consistent manner. Um, so eliminating that, you know, was super helpful. And then with speech to text, this could be, you know, audio books, um, getting any of those online books read or hard copies in online formats that can be read, but also, um, there are softwares out there. We use Read and Write um, that actually allows like other content to also be read out loud. So it can be used on you know accessible websites, our Brightspace pages to help with those um, where students can listen, you know, listen while they're following along to, you know, maybe it's the instructions of an assignment versus somebody sitting with them to talk through that. Um, they're becoming, like I said, more and more popular um, across campus because it eliminates, you know, that reliance on another human where there's, you know, more air, more coordination and things like that. I do see Chloe's on the call from LSC. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, so we just in addition to some of the <clears throat> speech to text, we also have a software that we use for some students for exams and tests and quizzes to have those read aloud as well. So it again removes that like relying on another person, then they can kind of use it as they need it as opposed to having someone in the room with them having to read everything. Um, so that's kind of an additional thing that we use as well. And I would say too, like it's so important for students that are transitioning to post-secondary after high school is like, <clears throat> for them to be able to articulate what they need to be successful. So that is something that they will be asked. First of all, like what is their disability and how it impacts their learning, but what do they need? So we really, I think, have to um, educate and get them comfortable with being able to you know, speak to that. Um, and I'm assuming Hannah and Chloe too, like, you know, you're looking for things maybe in terms of assistive technology that they have tried using. Um, and then how does it work if we, like, let's say the student come in and they say, well, I had a para that did my notes for me or read my tests aloud for me. Like, what do you recommend for a student like that coming in that maybe hasn't utilized as much assistive technology as they should have? Yeah, um, so it happens, you know, where students are come in that were very reliant on their para. Um, usually <clears throat> we try to work with them um, with having them meet with um, somebody from our office to kind of walk through how those programs work. Um, I will say Glean has a lot of very like quick, short, um, informational vit like videos that are very easy to follow along. Um, so that's helpful, but we always, you know, if it is somebody that we think is going to need some extra support, we'll work with them more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we do at CSS, we have some peer mentors that we can pair them up with um, to explore that. But like you said, it is important for students to be able to say what works for them and what doesn't. Um, and this goes for, you know, any type of 
AT, I had a student recently who ASL interpreters are work better for her that, better for them than CART does, which CART is a real-time captioning um, service. They're just not familiar with it. They are familiar with the ASL. Um, so, um, but they were able to speak to that. So it's important for students to be able to speak to what does and what doesn't work for them coming in um, and knowing what their accommodations are too. A lot of students come in with a IEP or 504 and are like, well, I use testing accommodations. And then I had other ones, but I'm not really sure what they were. So then it takes a, it takes a lot more work with them to figure out, okay, we need accommodations around this area, or it could be, you know, halfway through the semester, they're coming back and like, oh, yeah, I had an accommodation around this. Can I get that here? Um, so it's, you know, it requires a little bit more back and forth versus the students that know what accommodations they had and are able to speak to them. Next slide, Julie. Looking at the um, stance of work, um, you know, from my lens, assistive technology can really boost that confidence and independence of students um, and empower communication. Um, and I've noticed, like, just training is more inclusive, so they're able to, like, be a part of the setting that they're working in with their coworkers versus feeling isolated. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, Julie. So Cindy, if you don't mind, I'll hand this off to you talking just from that employment lens and VRS and kind of the assessment that you have done with students. Sure, okay. I'm happy to do that. So in VRS, the, the process for AT is really all about employment. So as the high schools are responsible for AT when they're there and the colleges are responsible for AT when they're doing post-secondary. We're really um, focused on just the employment piece and that's the piece that we can fund. It always starts with an AT assessment and in um, Minnesota VR, we have AT liaisons on the teams. I happen to be our AT liaison um, for the Duluth office but there are um, ones all over the state. And then we also have an AT specialist who will come in and work with um, people if there are greater needs. We also do contract that for, so we actually have a rehab engineer that we can contract with to um, fabricate things um, once the AT assessment has been done. Um, and it's very individualized. And it's really all about trying to help people be competitively employed. Um, in the Duluth office, we do actually have, um, and this is brand new, a um, office with some assistive technology that people can come in and try out. So we've got things like adjustable workstations, specialized keyboards, screen readers, um, different adaptive equipment and switches. And there are lots of community resources as well. So the um, Lighthouse Center for Independent Living has a lot of adaptive equipment that people can borrow and assistive technology people can use. If, if a student or um, adult needs more um, home-based technology, there is um, the program called Technology for Home, and that is typically waiver funded. And so they can have someone come in and do an AT assessment in the home to really help them um, find what works best to be as independent as they can in their home and community. And I know students participating in the work experience uh, is, a, is a great way to determine if they need any type of assistive technology to perform a job. And so you know, while they're doing work experience in high school, it gives such a great time to really figure out how a student functions and the level of independence or lack thereof and, um, and pull in the needed resources or trial things as needed. Um, the other thing too, for me, I think self-determination skills are of the utmost importance. Like I feel like every student who's on an IP needs a goal related to this. Um, 
I still work on a lot of these skills myself, but <laughs> um, these are so important um, for success in adulthood and especially in employment and transitioning into the post-secondary and just participating in the community. And so, you know, looking at assistive technology for these areas, like so much of our smartphones now really help us with organization, time management. Um, so I think, I think we need to be able to welcome the amount of technology kids have in the palm of their hands and, you know, set those appropriate boundaries and, and trial things that, that they have on their phones to help them because it's going to carry with them when they go home and into adulthood. So um, I just wanted to share some of those, those skill determination skills and focusing on that. Right, Julie, I see we have four minutes, so I'll try to be quick. But one super good tool I wanted to share with you guys. So charting a life course, which I'm absolutely in love with, has a ton of amazing, good resources. And one of the resources they have is called this integrated star. And when you look at it, it, it needs to be done as a collaborative approach. So I've done this with high school teams as they transition from middle school to high school, or um, or we're just looking at maybe, for example, just the employment side. Um, but it's a really cool tool where we really kind of break down the student and really focus on that person centered. As you can see, Julie, the actual picture has a link that will bring you to the actual Charting the Life course um, website. <clears throat> and it, if you go on the website, it breaks down this integrated star into various transitional topics. So employment, um, spirituality and religion. Um, maybe keep going down, Julie, towards the bottom. Keep going, keep going. So right here are examples of what they look like when they're completed. But you're identifying the strengths, and you can click on one, Julie, if you want to download it to show people um, the strengths and interests of the student and pulling in everyone on the child's team to, to offer insight into that. Um, looking at it has on their assistive technology. So the thing I like about, about this form is you're focusing on one aspect of that child's life and then breaking down each of these areas, focusing on that. So assistive technology with this, like for daily life, like what are some things the student needs or is able to do independently or focus on what are we needing to work on? So uh, it's a really great tool. Charting the Life course like does a really good job of like tutorial videos on it. Um, I, it it's a little cumbersome to use at first, I will forewarn, but uh, we've had a lot of like families leave, parents leave feeling like, oh my gosh, that was so valuable. Um, so you'll have to try it out if, if you have time. We've done it just as colleagues with each other too. So just to try it. We can go back, Julie. Thank you. <clears throat> One more. Yep. And this is a thing that I found a couple years ago. So I apologize. I checked on some of the links, but again, the image is linked. Um, and these are all different apps to support transition. And it's broken down by study, skills, daily living, organization, vocational, reading, and writing. And so each of those images on the outer circle are different apps related to those um, topics or areas. So I've like brought some of these up at IEP meetings for kids to try out or the teams to try out. So <clears throat> I just wanted to share share that resource with you if you haven't seen it before it's it's pretty cool and i just want to share just a few more resources like in terms of employment accommodations jan is a really great resource so job accommodation network um so you can certainly check that out pacer has a lot a lot of amazing resources related to assistive technology and they break it down by each of the transition areas um, Social Security has their ticket to work, which talks a lot about just assistive technology and accommodations. 
part of it. And then the Easter Seals crossword also um, has a lot of really good resources for assistive te technology based around um, employment and just generally secondary transition. So I wanted to share those so we can have those as a reference. 301, Julie, I think that was it. <clears throat> Perfect timing, Jessica. Um, I will go ahead and stop screen sharing now, but if, if it's okay, we'll open it up for questions and answers. I know we've kind of, um, we had some questions come up in the um, in the registration form that were kind of about general transition stuff. We've really focused today, of course, about assistive technology, knowing that these are AT office hours, um, but wanted to just open it up and see if any people have any questions for these great presenters that we've got here today. You can feel free to type them in the chat window or unmute yourselves and ask a question. And if there aren't any questions, of course, thanks so much for joining us and huge thanks to our presenters for um, sharing this information today. We'll make sure that we hang around a little while longer and make sure that we can answer any questions. Um, I will go ahead and stop the recording now.